would have even come to light, she would have just been shot and carted off and that would have been the end of that. But she was drawn to the mosque. And as she went into the mosque, she's wearing Pakistani clothes. She's not an Afghan woman. She immediately attracted attention because of the state that she was in. And people tried to talk to her. She couldn't understand what they were saying. She didn't speak their language. And quite a crowd gathered and the police arrived and the police obviously took her away and took her to the, to the station. I don't think that was actually supposed to happen. I think that um, arrangements had been made to have her just taken out as she stood outside the governor's house. During her interrogation in the Afghan police station, a young man emerged and she was told this was her son. She didn't recognize him and he didn't recognize her. She was then questioned more and taken into a police cell. And the FBI rang up the head of counter-terrorism in Gasney and said, oh, we hear that you've arrested a person who might be of interest to us. And the, the uh, counter-terrorism chief said yes, and they said, well, we have come down and collect her. And he said, no, she's my prisoner. And nobody's taken her. This is my investigation. So they said, well, can we at least talk to her? And he said, maybe tomorrow. She's just starting to open up to me, and I'm going to find out more about who she is and what she is. The next day, the FBI arrived with 12, 13 soldiers, all pumped high with adrenaline because they're going to take away this Al-Qaeda fanatic. This is how she's been described to them. So they go into the police cell. Can you imagine, 12, 13 soldiers, I've been in that police cell. It must have been cramped. And they're all pumped up high on, on adrenaline, waiting for orders to go and take the prisoner. There's an argument developing because the Afghan counter-terrorism chief doesn't want to let her go because this is his investigation. If there has been a crime committed, it's been committed on Afghan soil in his backyard and he wants to investigate. So this argument is going to and fro. There's a dividing curtain, and on the other side of that curtain is Afia Siddiqui, who's lying on a bed, and she hears this kerfuffle. So she gets up. One of the soldiers sees a movement, and what I was told is he went straight in, saw that Afia Siddiqui, unlike any other prisoner in the war on terror who is shackled, hooded, and, and cannot move, is moving freely around the cell and he shoots her. And as a shooting match kicks off and a lot of people run out of the cell and Afia has been shot twice, possibly three times. And she's lying there in a pool of blood. And she's dying. This was not supposed to happen this way. What the American administration then told us was that Afia Siddiqui had taken the M4, an M4 um, semi-automatic from a soldier, had wrestled it from him and had fired off two rounds in this cell. And they, in an attempt to subdue her, had fired back and shot her. This is what we're expected to believe. As I say, I've been in that cell. The reality is if she'd swung a cat, she would have hit four or five soldiers straight away. 
So she's supposed to have fired off two rounds. How on earth did she miss? She should have hit somebody. But not only did she allegedly fire off two rounds, she didn't hit anybody, and those bullets can't be found. And neither can the shell casings. And there are no fingerprints on the M4. And we've all seen CSI. There were no ex there's no explosive residue, nothing. All the signs said she could not have fired the gun. Furthermore, if she had, she would have been the first person in the entire history of the war on terror to have managed to have got a gun from an American soldier. What American soldier is going to wander into a cell where he's told Mrs. Al-Qaeda is on the other side? Who's going to put a gun down? They were pumped up and really hyped up and, and nervous. Then we're told that having shot her three times, she's supposed to have continued to fight back. And they had to hand cover and subdue her further. She was helicoptered out and taken to Bagram where she was on a life support machine for about two days before she was then carted off to America. Another rendition flight. No extradition. Now I'm not a lawyer, but you tell me if somebody commits a crime in Afghanistan, surely they would be charged with that crime in Afghanistan. She's a Pakistani citizen. Why on earth would she be renditioned to America? And, unlike everybody else who's been renditioned to America and ends up in Guantanamo, she is the only one who was put through a court system. The judge should never have allowed that trial to go ahead, but I'll come back to him later. So she's had, she's got these severe injuries. She's had a during surgery. I'm told that she had a kidney removed and part of her intestine um, removed. She's in and out of consciousness. And while she's heavily medicated, she was interrogated by the FBI. Who didn't disclose who they were. They could have been doctors, they could have been diplomats, they could have been anybody. But they were the FBI. And while in custody, she didn't have access to any lawyers. She didn't have her rights rented. She had nothing. The whole situation from that point was flawed. Then we get to the pre-trial period. There was great excitement when the FBI announced that uh, Afia had been arrested. Never once was she charged with any crime related to terrorism, and yet she was given the same high profile as a terrorist. She was denied effective access to family and people that she could trust. She was forced to have government lawyers. She wasn't allowed to choose her own. She was kept in solitary confinement with no privacy or dignity. She was mentally, verbally and physically abused including religious taunts. Have the US learned nothing about treating Muslims in custody? She was continually strip searched. Every time she left her cell to make a phone call, to answer a phone call, to see her legal team, she was put through this. Now we come on to the post-conviction period. Within a day of her conviction, despite any evidence 
All of Afia's prison rights were revoked.